Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we are re-recording this meeting. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Prairie Rivers Network. I'm Anthony Henson, the Rural Energy Organizer here at the firm. Um, thank you for joining us on the Rural Electric Cooperative Scorecard Initiative. Uh, we got a full agenda today. Uh, we're going to have about a 15-minute presentation followed by uh, a few speakers discussing their perspective on rural electric cooperatives. So we will go ahead and get started. Uh, the Rural Electric Cooperative Scorecard Initiative has had a big week. Uh, we officially launched on September the 4th. Uh, we've had a very productive week on this subject matter uh, with lots of earned media and lots of documents uh, such as social media toolkit being shared with partner organizations. Um, we're definitely trying to get the word out about this scorecard report to as many people as possible. So we appreciate you joining us today. So what is a rural electric cooperative? Uh, cooperatives deliver electricity to rural places not served by investor owned utilities. Investor-owned utilities in Illinois are Ameren and ComEd. Uh, Co-ops were established by the Rural Electrification Act of 1936. And that was part of the New Deal and FDR's efforts to turn around the economy at the time. Uh, Investor-owned utilities in the 30s and 40s found uh, electrifying rural areas to be unprofitable. Uh, so this act stepped in, provided low-cost loans that allowed cooperatives uh, to uh, self-organized um, as self-organized organizations responsive to their member owners. Uh, there's a great picture down here, courtesy of Corn Belt Electric Co-op. Um, farmers, rural homeowners, rural businesses had to get together in the 30s and 40s um, in order to electrify their rural areas. Now, these co-ops have strong claims to local control and democratic decision-making. And this is often the basis of rural electric cooperatives of uh, being awarded. Make that point to show it is important for grassroots participation uh, when it comes to organizing with co-ops. Uh, rural electric co-ops in Illinois. Uh, there are 25 distribution co-ops in Illinois. Uh, these are responsible to distribute electricity locally to rural areas and they are owned and governed by the members they serve uh, through the election of a board of directors. Uh, the next level up, uh, there is five generation transmission co-ops. Uh, these are often referred to as GNTs, and these are co-ops of co-ops. Uh, the distribution co-ops uh, gather together and form the larger generation and transmission co-op. Uh, their responsibility is to generate and move electricity over a longer distance. Um, and importantly, GNT co-ops in Illinois are co-owners of the Prairie State Coal Plant. Uh, the Prairie State Coal Plant is located in Southern Illinois and is the seventh largest coal polluter in the nation. I uh, wanted to go through the origins of the cooperative scorecards themselves. Uh, this was born out of a group uh, and REAMP. REAMP is a 10 state Midwestern environmental advocacy firm. Um, and these scorecards were performed in three states um, and Illinois led by Prairie Rivers Network and Citizens Utility Board. Um, also uh, scorecards were done in Wisconsin through the Green Neighbor Challenge and North Dakota through North Dakota Native Vote and the Dakota Resource Council. Uh, we were excited to work uh, with North Dakota as well uh, as it aligns with our value-driven mission here at PRN. Um, you can see there are other co-op scorecards that exist. Uh, we use democracy, uh, energy democracy y'all's scorecards in the southeastern states um, and Minnesota Cure scorecards in Minnesota as the basis for our methodology in the Illinois scorecards as well. Ultimately, this is a practice in energy democracy. Uh, we like to say we're putting the power back in public power. Uh, this is REAM's definition of energy democracy, investing in community-driven solutions to create energy system transformation towards clean and democratically owned energy. 
Uh, you can see the main areas of focuses that are often included in energy democracy work. Um, this scorecard obviously hits uh, category number one, building community-owned power and taking back member power in rural electric co-ops. Uh, so now we are going to take a look at a three and a half minute video. Uh, this is credit to story is stuff. And we found out that Minnesota Cures is one that funded this uh, video. Um, it's information packed. Um, it goes through the challenges, and opportunities available to co-ops and the history in which they developed. Uh, so enjoy. In rural America, community is everything. We celebrate each other's successes and support each other when times are tough. And lately, rural Americans have been struggling. Costs are rising on groceries, electric bills, and more. Jobs are harder to come by, and extreme weather is threatening everything from crops to the power grid. Rural Americans know all this. Almost 100 years ago, rural communities came together to change the course of their lives and of history in the process. In 1935, electricity was common in cities, but not on farms and other rural areas. At the time, a mere one out of 10 rural households were receiving electric services. Forward-thinking rural Americans organized and demanded the government invest in their future. And it worked. The Rural Electrification Administration was created as part of the New Deal to give loans for electrification and telephone services in rural areas. Fueled by government investment, farmers once again band together and rural electric cooperatives were born. The idea was these co-ops would be people powered, just like modern co-ops today. A massive transformation occurred. 90% of rural America became electrified and these communities thrived. Today, these co-ops provide electricity to more than 42 million rural Americans. But over the years, government investment hasn't always been consistent. All that infrastructure has aged, become less efficient, and energy costs have risen. Plus, two-thirds of rural electricity comes from fossil fuel power plants, which are more expensive compared to clean energy facilities. Rural electric co-ops have also gotten stuck paying off debt for this outdated infrastructure. And that's how some of America's lowest income communities ended up paying the highest prices for electricity. But now there's another opportunity to transform rural lives. Recent federal investments like the Inflation Reduction Act have allocated around $11 billion for rural electric co-ops to voluntarily invest in renewable energy systems. Energy that's cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable. What could this mean for a rural community? How about the weatherization of homes so folks can lower their energy bills and live more comfortably? New solar and wind installations that create well-paying jobs and battery energy storage that strengthens energy independence. There are also innovative solutions like agrivoltics, where farmers earn extra money from solar panels that share the same fields as crops and even livestock. But to get there, rural folks have to come together once more. Too many co-op leaders are stuck in their ways and even create barriers for member owners to have their voices heard. In fact, you may be a member owner in a rural electric co-op like 42 million other Americans and not even realize it. If member owners demand it, a rural electric cooperative can position itself as a leader in energy innovation. They can aid a struggling community, inspire other communities to follow, and transform rural America once again for the better. Hope you enjoy that. Um, it was a, a very solid piece that goes through the history of the co-ops as well. I hope you took something out of it. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to take you on a quick tour of the Rural Electric Cooperative scorecards. Uh, this is the beginning of the interface. Uh, this interface was funded by Wisconsin Climate Table uh, through a mini grant. 
uh, that allowed us uh, to set up this system. Um, we're going to select Illinois since we're in Illinois. And of course, there we go. Uh, the first thing we can do is select your co-op. Uh, we're going to select Adams Electric um, as its first alphabetically. Uh, we took a look at 16 metrics uh, with our methodology. Uh, we started with the fuel mix. Uh, this fuel mix is as reported to FERC. Um, and then we did 16 me metrics, uh, eight in programs and eight in governance, transparency, and accessibility. Uh, you can see uh, here what we score the co-ops on, uh, energy efficiency rebates, efficiency loan programs, inclusive investment programs, uh, green energy pricing and community solar. We also took a look at net metering policies, their credit retention policies, and disconnection protection uh, for delinquent payments, uh, uh, temperature reasons, or for medical reasons. On accessibility side, uh, we look for bill explainers. Are they communicating about IRA uh, uh, rebates and incentives? Um, do they tell their members how to vote and run for the Rural Electric Cooperative Board? Do they publish uh, meetings and agendas, their board contact info, uh, their 990s, and their bylaws as well? Uh, this is an interactive interface. Uh, if you take a look at my cursor, um, every yes response uh, will take you directly to the web page. Uh, that earned the score on the metric. Uh, so it's interactive in that way. Uh, we also um, found the GNTs for each of the co-ops. You can find this in the lower left corner. We also have additional uh, functionality, including contacts, which would allow member owners or practitioners to directly contact the electric cooperative or get involved um, on the grassroots level through an Illinois intake form, which goes directly to either Prairie Rivers Network or CUB. Excuse me. Um, also, you can do statewide comparisons. We'll move down here. Um, once again, looking at Adams Electric, uh, simply by tapping the top line, uh, we can compare, yes, Adams Electric does rebates, and all these cooperatives do as well. I mean, you can do this under each of the metrics uh, scored. Uh, so it's really interactive, and it's really built out uh, for easy use by member owners to better understand their co-ops. Uh, this remains true in accessibility as well. Uh, so it's just a really neat tool that can be used by the co-ops to improve their websites, uh, by solar wind practitioners to better understand uh, their ecosystem, uh, but it's mostly built out for the member owners uh, to engage with their co-ops. Uh, the last thing, and an FAQ page, um, you can play around with this and check out how we chose each of the measure definitions and standards. So that was a quick tour. I'd also like to go through some key takeaways. Um, here's some key takeaways from the programs. Only three cooperatives posted their fuel mix on their websites. Uh, we're definitely hoping for distribution co-ops to start posting their fuel mix. Uh, Two thirds of cooperatives offer efficiency rebates to the member owners but only a quarter offer efficiency loan programs, which is a place they can approve. About a third do offer green pricing program, but only 12% of cooperatives offer a community solar program, which we think could be an opportunity for co-ops in the future. 20% um, of cooperatives reimburse excess energy delivered to the grid at a rate above avoided cost. Uh, so this means about 80% of co-ops have policies that make it harder for their customers to go solar compared to Ameren and ComEd customers. Uh, Two-thirds cooperatives have an annual true update. 
and about two thirds of cooperatives do offer some disconnection prote protection of some sort. A key, key takeaways with accessibility and governance transparency. Um, about two thirds of the cooperatives publish an electric bill explainer. We'd like to see that go up. And a third publish information regarding the IRA rebates and incentives. Uh, we expect these IRA rebates and incentives to be released in Illinois in the spring of 2025. Uh, so we hope to see improvement in the next uh, iteration of the scorecards uh, next year. About half of cooperatives publish information on how to vote in board elections or how to run in board elections. Uh, we find this to be unacceptable. Uh, it's too low of a number. Rural electric cooperatives are governed democratically, uh, meaning member owners are responsible for selecting and influencing board members. Uh, but despite this commitment to democratic governance and the uh, environmental regulation carve outs it produces, um, over half, uh, half of co don't have information available online on how to vote and run for the board. Um, it's something we'll be pushing co-ops on moving into 2025. Uh, only a third published of board meetings and agendas, about half published direct contact information from the board, and 20% of cooperatives published their 990s, and only 80% of cooperatives published their bylaws. Uh, we're hoping to push that up to 100% by next year. Um, important thing to remember um, that as member owners, your voice matters. Um, this is call to action of what you can do in order to get involved. Uh, re reach out to PRN and Citizens Utility Board to talk about your co-op. Uh, email your co-op about the scorecard and ask how they're thinking about improving their scores. Um, vote in your co-op elections. Uh, these elections can be opaque and they're low voter turnout, uh, but you can make a difference by just simply voting in the elections. Uh, attend a co-op board meeting. Uh, PRN can assist with talking points if you're interested in doing that. Or host your rural neighbors for a small conversation about your co-op, another activity PRN can help with. Um, and ultimately, uh, we would like to see people run for your co-op board, um, especially if you're in favor of renewable energy. Um, some key links and information. Um, we hope that we'll share these uh, slides with you. Um, moving forward, uh, so you can have this information in front of you. Um, so with that, um, that is the end of the slideshow, and I would like to send it over to Scott Allen from Cub, who's going to talk about the Citizen Utility Board perspective on the scorecards. Scott? Thank you, Anthony, and hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Allen. I'm the renewable, uh, I'm sorry, the energy policy specialist for Citizens Utility Board or CUB. And CUB is a not-for-profit utility watchdog and consumer advocacy organization. We were started with the CUB Act of 1983 and the General Assembly gave CUB the task of promoting the health, welfare, and prosperity of all the citizens of the state by ensuring effective democratic representation of utility consumers before the Commerce Commission, the courts, the General Assembly, and other public bodies. Uh, until recently, most of our advocacy focused on customers of the state's investor-owned utilities, but following the passage of the Future Energy Jobs Act in 2016, and especially after the passage of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act in 2021, CUB has seen a steady and concerning increase in complaints and inquiries from members of distribution co-ops, and nearly all of them present uh, similar questions such as why don't I have access to the same programs, incentives, and protections that Amherst or ComEd customers do, and what can I do to change that? Uh, the fact is that a lot of people, as mentioned in the video, don't understand the difference between a co-op and an investor-owned utility. They don't understand why state laws and regulations or benefits and protections don't apply to them. What they see is that the General Assembly has declared a disruption to the utility industry that's intended to be more transparent, more beneficial to utility consumers, and using the transition away from fossil fuels as a way to reduce the burden of utility costs. However, electric co-ops are not subject to those same disruptions unless the boards of those co-ops self-impose them. So for CUB, uh, that's why this scorecard was so important. We can't advocate for co-op members in the same way that we can advocate for ComEd or Ameren customers. 
Uh, they have to do that for themselves. But when there's no mandate for transparency or inclusion or consumer protections or um, a just transition, it's really difficult for them to. So with this scorecard, we hope that people can better understand how their co-ops operate and how they as co-owners of the utility have a right to create change. So Cub sees this as an educational tool, as a method of accountability, and we would like to see a significant improvement in the assessments that Anthony went through. And we'd like to see that the people who have contacted Cub over the years find their ways onto the boards of their co-ops. Uh, whether a utility is regulated or unregulated is really irrelevant. Uh, these are essential services and the nature and quality um, of these services is changing and we need to see that matched um, across the board. So uh, thank you and I'll give it back to Anthony. Uh, thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to hear from Michelle Knox now, founder of Wind Solar USA, uh, discussing uh, solar practitioners' uh, viewpoint. Michelle? Thank you, Anthony. Um, yes, I am Michelle Knox. I'm the owner of Wind Solar USA, located in Springfield, Illinois. I started my renewable energy business back in 2008, went full time in November of 2011 and have done many installs in rural electric um, cooperative territories across central and southern Illinois since that time. Um, throughout my career, I have worked to help identify and address policy differences in rural cooperative and municipal utility territories versus the investor-owned utilities of Ameren and ComEd that do have public oversight by the Illinois Commerce Commission um, in an effort to work cooperatively and collaboratively with the utilities, their administrators, their boards, and power providers to bridge the gaps where possible. Out of this work came hot topics that are presently being addressed through a bill that is in play in the Illinois House of Representatives called the Solar Bill of Rights, HB 5315, for any of you that are interested in taking a look. Um, as Anthony had mentioned, there are 25 different cooperatives ranked on the scorecard based on criteria criteria that coincides with some of the hot topics. The hottest of those topics are the feedback rate for excess generation. Um, it has always been the retail rate in the investor owned utilities with a one to one exchange. That um, does change on 1231 of 24 to net metering for only the supply side of the kilowatt hour rate, no longer including the distribution portion of that kilowatt hour rate but also offers a rebate for both energy and storage based on the rating of the inverter and battery banks respectively. However, many cooperatives only offer avoided cost for the feedback um, of uh, for the feedback rate. And that's generally somewhere between 3.2 and 3.5 cents, which is, does not take into account any of the benefits to their distribution system for neighbors feeding neighbors um, and, um, and have never offered a rebate of any kind. With each of the cooperatives in the state having the ability to set their own feedback rate and policies, this means that developers like myself must be versed on up to 25 to 30 different policies to ensure that customers living in the various cooperative territories are modeled correctly. This creates consumer protection concerns due to not having any standardization. I've traveled across the state and assisted customers in multiple cooperative territories to try to help gain some kind of legacying or grandfathering of their policies that customers initially signed up for um, that then changed when their cooperatives set, hit a solar penetration percentage of solar versus their peak load of either one, two, three, five, or maybe 10% at best. Um, in most cases, we were able to get a period of three, five, or even 10 years implemented. But again, the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, offer 30 years from the date the system was energized. This, the uh, industry models customers based on a 25-year financial performance that follows the manufacturer's warranties. So changing the policy in three, five, or even 10 years does not allow the member owners to recognize the cash gained over the warranted life of the system that they were expecting. As Scott mentioned, transparency is another issue. So transparency and front-facing policies that are easily accessible, 
for all to see and, and interpret from the website is something that was addressed in the Qu Climate and Equitable Jobs Act's right to self-generate. And as we can see from the scorecard, most have made efforts to update their websites um, to have solar policies listed that make it easier for consumers and developers um, to access that information. But there is still work to be done on making the board minutes, the bylaws, and contact information for elected officials available, as Anthony highlighted. Having a process to resolve conflict with your cooperative is also something that is important. Rather than Michelle and others on this call uh, running all over the state and trying to advocate for member owners when a conflict arises, we'd like to see the Illinois Commerce Commission be able to provide assistance as a third party intermediary for conflict resolution. Of course, we'd like the member owner and the cooperative to first attend board meetings together to try to resolve the conflict internally. But when that can't be accomplished, we feel that cooperative members should have the same channel of assistance through the ICC free of charge for conflict resolution as those Illinoisans living in Ameren and ComEd territories enjoy. Presently, the only way to do that is through the legal process, um, which can be costly to consumers and that cost in many cases serves as a deterrent to the cooperative member owner following through with complaints and concerns. In closing, this scorecard is a wonderful tool that I can't thank Prairie Rivers Network and Cub specifically Amanda, Anthony, and Scott, for working so hard to develop. Having this snapshot is helpful to member owners, cooperative staff and boards, legislators, solar developers like myself, and many others in seeing just how cooperative, cooperatives stack up in the comparison. We are just getting started in our efforts to continue cooperative and collaborative work to ensure that all Illinoisans have fair policies and access when it comes to considering solar and energy storage options for their home, business, or farm. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your perspective, Michelle. I uh, appreciate uh, what you put forth there. Uh, we're gonna move on to uh, two member, uh, rural electric co-op member owners who've had different experiences uh, going solar under co-op rules. Uh, the first is Dean Runtz, who is a member owner of the Rural Electric Convenience Cooperative. Dean? We might Hello? have... Hi, Dean. Hello? Hey. Yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you for... Okay, uh, good. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess where I want to get started. Um, after having installed the system, I... Uh, was notified that uh, you know, there was going to be a big change in uh, in the way that they conduct business. It's not going to be handled the way that it originally was was dealt to me. That they're going to uh, uh, not allow me to store power on the line and take it back, which originally was what I was told that I would be able to do. Um, in doing that, they are not sticking by their original agreement and they're they're telling me that I'm going to have a period of time that they're going to let me still do this to, to help me to pay for my piece of equipment. Um, I don't know of anyone that invests any money in anything that they don't, they don't want to break even. That's not the, that's not the point here. We're not trying to break even. We're trying to get a benefit from this. We're also trying to, uh, to go green the government wants to do all this okay so we put forth the effort now we're being penalized for it after the fact we're not sticking to the, the original agreement that is my big problem with all this a lot of what uh what i was going to say has already been said um i i do truly believe that there needs to be a grandfathering and uh, if they want to grandfather us in for the people who who did it on the original agreement, I'm kind of okay with that. I think that's what needs to be done. We're going to change. We need to change for the people who are coming in after the fact. They want to change the policy from this point on. It's this way, but we're going to keep it the way it was. That would make me very happy. Uh, I also, I don't agree with, with the aspect that 
when I originally went to put this in, I'm limited to 10 kW. That kind of should be, if I want more, I should be able to do it. So I have plans to add to my solar, to add to my to my system, but I have to do it offline. I'm going to do it just because REAs made me mad. You know, they they make deals, they don't stand behind them. Um, I also lost my second meter rate, which I wasn't aware that I was going to do that. So now they they've upped my total cost of my electric, as well as they want to take away from the, the benefit that I thought I was going to have, or at least partial part of the benefit I thought I was going to have by going solar. So let's see here. Thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience uh, with your co-op and uh, the challenge you've had by going solar. Uh, we wanted Dean to share his story um, as it's a, a good opportunity to share how changing policies on the cooperative side um, can neg negatively affect uh, folks going solar. Um, we'd like to change this up and go to Bill Sasso, um, who's going to talk about a positive experience. Well, um, thanks very much, and thanks to everyone who's developed the scorecard. I've looked at it, and I, I have found it a really interesting um, set of data about my own co-op, which is the Egyptian Electric Co-op. I'm in Carbondale, and um, in February of 2022, we had a four kilowatt installation put on our house. Um, it took about a month it was installed in a couple of days, and then it took about a month to get the Egyptian electric um, inspection scheduled before it could actually be operational. Um, Egyptian electric sent about six people out to look at it, and, and Southern Illinois Solar, the installer, sent some people out. So we had all kinds of people crawling around at the meters and stuff. Um, it was certified without any issues. Um, it's been in operation since then. Um, we, let's see, prior to installation, our annual electric bill was something like, um, I want to say something like 11, 11 or $1,200 a year. It's gone down to roughly $600 a year. Um, the, the installation, depending how much stuff I want to count, count as part of it, um, we paid Southern Illinois Solar roughly $12,000. Um, but we also had to upgrade our electrical service or at least every Every solar installer recommended that. So that was another $4,000 to upgrade from 110 service to 220 service. But um, it's it's something that I have been very glad that we did. Um, Egyptian Electric has you know, explained things to me when I've asked questions. Uh, what happened to that extra surplus in April? And yes, every April you're surplus gets zeroed out and that's one of our policies and it is a published policy on their website. Um, I came in after Egyptian Electric had hit its 1% threshold. And so I came in under, we came in, you know, after that adjustment, I'm not even sure what difference it would have made to us. Um, I have met with Egyptian Electric. Um, Egyptian Electric at one point, about a year and a half ago, was doing these monthly, you know, come to a coffee shop and meet with us if you have questions. And I um, was very impressed with the accessibility because hardly anybody else showed up as member owners. Uh, so I spent about half an hour talking to the, the executive director and the chief engineer, and they were explaining to me, um, well, answering questions. Um, and so um, it's been a it's been a, it's been very much what I expected. Um, there haven't been any unilateral changes, and one kind of wrinkle in terms of um, Egyptian Electric score um, on the scorecard is that while I've, we have service through Egyptian Electric, but we have gas service through Ameren, so we actually receive a lot of information about um, um, incentive programs and savings on um, savings on energy efficient utility, energy efficient appliances and stuff from Amarin. <laughs> so while I'm, in, while I'm with Egyptian Electric, I get a lot of Amarin information too. So maybe I'm just lucky in that sense. So, well, thanks very much. I'm happy to answer questions if it comes to a point where there are any questions. 
Thank you, Bill. Uh, that brings us to the end of our event. I uh, want to thank uh, Bill and all the speakers and everyone who showed up today uh, to engage with the scorecard. And with that, uh, we can enter uh, Q and A. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to come off mute or raise your hand. Amanda. If it's okay, yeah, if it's okay, I'll I'll kick us off with questions. Um, and mine is for for Bill. Um, I, Anthony shared with me that um you had an experience with your co-op voting during the pandemic. Um, so something Anthony and I have learned through our research is that, you know, mo when you vote for your co-op board, um, typically almost every single co-op is in-person voting at a single event or maybe a couple events that you have to attend to vote. So something we've been talking about is how, and, and we understand co-op voting turnout is very low. So how could co-ops make this voting process more accessible? So Bill, I think you had an experience of something your co-op did differently during the pandemic that I just thought was interesting and maybe a, a case study of how we could do things differently in the future time. Well, I, I think I tried to remember what had happened during the pandemic when, when Bill and I were talking, and I think I misremembered because I went back and looked and Egyptian Electric canceled its 2020 owners meeting, annual meeting, um, and deferred the election to the next year. Um, at the next year, they conducted the election in person with some, um, well, it was outdoors, um, I guess is the, the saving thing. But also as part of that 2021 meeting, they passed a bylaws amendment that allowed for I think it was electronic meetings in the case of a public health, I forget what word they used, crisis, disaster, situation, something. Um, I think I initially said that we had a vote by mail and that was not correct. That was my, mis my misremembrance. So I apologize for misleading people. Um, I have attended several of the in-person meetings. Um, they actually, Given that it's an in-person meeting, I think Egyptian Electric actually does, there's a lot of incentives to attend. There's door prizes. Everybody who attends gets a $10 or $20 discount on their next bill. Um, they give out scholarships to people entering, well, not entering, people attending college um, who are children of members or maybe members themselves. I'm not sure about that. So um, they, they do try to do that, and they certainly publicize that meeting. Uh, you have to be there in person in order to to win a scholarship. You have to sign. You have to pre-register and then you have to sign in. Um, my daughter was in college, and that motivated us to go to several meetings. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. They have those incentives, um, and yeah, no worries about misremembering how many of us are. You know, 2020, 2021 was an absolute blur. So, yes, it was. Um, and actually, uh, one, and one more thing they're doing, they've currently started doing is if you go to a meeting, you can you can be present at the meeting, but stay in your car and listen to the meeting on the radio. Uh, <laughs> not quite sure how the voting part works for that. But um, but at the very least, they're making, you know, some kinds of adjustments to help if people want to be at the meeting and are um, in, you know, need to be very careful at their home. Thanks for that yeah, question, Amanda. So. Yeah, we, we, we put Anthony, four. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. If you had some more uh, well, I, I just, we, we just sort of put in forth uh, that it would be a desired uh, outcome for co-ops to consider mail-in or online voting uh, for, their, for their board elections. Yeah. Um, I saw Jane's comment in the chat about... Um, her sense that Egyptian Electric, although they didn't have a perfect score, they were response. They have been responsive to new clean energy and EV charging station opportunities, and I, I think that has definitely been our experience with the leadership at Egyptian Electric. Is they are very excited about new opportunities. Um, there are challenges with long term power supply contracts with coal um, and other things, but they um, certainly at least from Prairie Rivers Network's perspective, those leaders at Egyptian have been 
wonderful to work with. And then, so I was going to kind of ask a question off of Jane's there is Anthony, could you tell everybody a little bit about how you reached after the, you did this research for the scorecards, how you let co-ops know this was happening and how many of them sure. you know, joined you to go over there or yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I discussed the methodology briefly earlier uh, with, with the multiple groups in different states, uh, but something we did differently here in Illinois after we scraped the websites for information is we offered office hours for the rural electric cooperatives themselves to get a sneak peek of the uh, metrics and either to concur or disagree with the score given. Uh, that was a very successful um, endeavor. We had 16 out of the 25 Illinois co-ops um, engage with the office hours. Um, it was very useful one, establishing working relationships, a positive working relationship with the cooperatives is important to us. Uh, but it also allowed us to really zero in on these metrics and ensure the most accurate scorecard as possible. Uh, so we really thank the co-ops for going through that process. Uh, Bill. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask, I mean, I know Egyptian Electric um, tabulates, cap, you know, captures the information about how much um, <clears throat> electricity goes from my installation into the grid because um, they bank that for me, uh, right? So they have that information. I wonder if they and other co-ops too couldn't just, you know, add that up and consider that as as a component in their electrical supply. I know Egyptian Electric, you know, just has a fossil fuel, you know, element on your scorecard. It seems like it would have the data to include a, you know, owner generated solar component or possibly, I mean, I yeah. don't know if anybody has wind turbines, um, but, um, you know, it seems like that's something that Egyptian Electric, in, I mean, that's the only co-op I know about, has the data for. So. You know, it's sort of weird, you know, I wonder if anyone has asked them about doing that. I haven't thought about asking them, um, <clears throat> but, you know, kind of it would it would relate to the scorecard, um, you know, energy portfolio mix. Um, so that's a that's a question that maybe the next time you're talking to them about the scorecard, you could ask. Yeah, thank you for that, Bill. Um, fuel mix was a, diff a difficult metric uh, to score. Uh, we end up settling on a tool by Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, which allowed us to see the generation numbers as reported to FERC by the GNTs and the distributions. Um, we're hoping that starts a conversation with the distribution co-ops uh, where they'd be willing to um, publish their field mix on their websites moving forward. So appreciate that, Bill. And Anthony, we've got a couple questions in the chat I can help you out with here. Um, Joyce has a friend in the Spoon River Electric Cooperative who has been um, frustrated with her board being a closed shop, being unresponsive. Um, and this friend attended an annual meeting um, and was disturbed by some of the things she saw and heard. Um, I would, I'll hand it to you, Anthony, but real quick, I would just share that, you know, we'd love Prairie Rivers Network would love to connect with this person, Joyce, and, and talk with yep. them about their experience and how we can help. Um, I have heard similar things about annual meetings um, where the words energy efficiency and solar are not even uttered at the meeting, or if solar comes up, it's part of a conversation about um, blackouts and brownouts. And um, so that's, you know, with this day and age, I mean, that video that Anthony showed and all the opportunity both from state climate and equitable jobs act and federal laws I mean, there's so much opportunity that co-ops could be exploring just last week usda announced 7.3 billion in funding for um, clean energy projects and rural electric cooperatives um, that will serve like 20 percent of rural people um, that get their power from rural co-ops across the nation um, so far, we've heard there's one distribution in co-op that was part of that 
funding announcement through Dairyland, which is a Wisconsin-based G&T co-op. Um, and we do know a few other Illinois co-ops applied but didn't get that funding. So, you know, they should be talking about these things at their annual meetings. Um, should be a, a moment to reinvigorate and excite people about the energy transition. Um, anyway, Anthony, I'll let you add any additional thoughts for Joyce on how yeah, yeah. to support her friend. Uh, Joyce, yeah, I'm sorry to hear the negative experience of your friend. Um, that is a complex uh, question and situation. Uh, so I actually linked in the chat our Google Doc. Um, if you take a look at that and have your friend uh, fill out that document, it will go to myself and Scott Allen, and uh, we'd be able to take the proper time and see if we can assist. And then Anthony in the chat, Mike Cat asked if you could share what nine co-ops did not engage in those office hours. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. I could give you the 16 that did. Uh, but Mike, uh, I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. And, uh, and Mike, I know you're an Eastern Illini customer and I believe they did participate. Eastern, Eastern Illini did participate. and gave good feedback. All right, we're at the 50 minute mark. Um, we'd have time for one or two more questions um, if, they're, if they're out there. All right, I'm not seeing any further questions. Uh, once again, uh, thank you all for uh, coming today and participating in this debriefing. Uh, we hope the information was digestible um, and usable in the future as you think about your rural electric co-ops.